One big step rather than two small steps. <laughs> Aloha mai kako. Aloha. Mahalo to Tuti uh, Sanborn for the Oli. Uh, she is the winner of the Chancellor's Award for Adjunct Faculty of the Year this past year. <laughs> College. I'm Doug Dykstra. I'm the Chancellor here at Windward. And uh, we've got this beautiful 64-acre rolling campus of greenery. We've got 2,600 students and too many chickens. <laughs> but uh, in large measure, this beautiful campus is the product of the efforts of uh, these two gentlemen uh, in their partnership as uh, legislators, as well as many others in the legislature back in 1991. Uh, and this is what it has come to. I feel so fortunate. Uh, I've been here for six and a half years now, and uh, what a wonderful uh, job has been done at this campus. It's my honor today to welcome uh, the Honorable Governor of the State of Hawaii, David Ige. <laughs> as well as his Chief of Staff, Mike McCartney. <laughs> now, also in the audience accompanying the Governor is his uh, Director of the Department of Health, Dr. Virginia Pressler. And uh, Deputy Director of the Department of Transportation, Ed Sniffen. <laughs> and finally, the Governor's Coordinator on Homelessness, Scott Morshide. <laughs> now, I'm also honored to welcome uh, area legislators who includes Senator Jill Takuda, <laughs> Representative Ken Ito, <laughs> Senator Laura Thielen, <laughs> Representative Jared Kehokolole, Representative Chris Lee. <laughs> and Senator Gil Riviera. <laughs> and uh, uh, Representative Becky Puha. <laughs> Glad you could all make it tonight. You know, today's forum is the start of uh, a grassroots statewide dialogue on issues of importance, and uh, we hope this will encourage community collaboration going forward. Uh, I will not take too much time here other than to just briefly explain to you that uh, tonight's session will be moderated by the Executive Director of the Pacific American Foundation, Mr. Herb Lee. I think we've got the formalities out of way, out of the way, and I'd like to uh, 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 yield the floor to uh, Governor David E. Gay. Uh, 
thank you all for uh, joining us. Um, as uh, Chancellor Dykstra has mentioned, this is the very first uh, community connection that we're having. Uh, we are going across the stage so that we have an opportunity uh, to engage communities to talk about uh, issues that are important to you. Uh, but I think the challenge will be that uh, there are many issues in our community. We uh, try to work to identify that are our most interest on the community side. Obviously, uh, we won't get to everything that people are concerned with, but more than happy to uh, engage the dialogue uh, beyond the end of the time that we have. Uh, I just want you to know that we're starting in the windward side for a reason. Uh, you have a terrific uh, group of legislators who really do advocate on your behalf. Uh, I'm proud to be able to um, call most of them uh, former colleagues of mine. Uh, I can tell you that they do a terrific job at the state capitol, really advocating on, on your behalf, uh, raising the issues that are, are foremost in your mind, uh, and most importantly, uh, getting things done in state government so that uh, you can enjoy their benefits. I would just like to acknowledge, uh, you know, it's always a, a balance about um, trying to get the directors here, uh, but we did want to um, make available to you as we uh, proceed forward. I just wanted to recognize a couple of directors uh, who are here uh, and uh, would be available if you have specific questions. We have the uh, department or chairman of the Board of Agriculture, Scott Enright. For We also have Ford Kuchigami, uh, Director of Transportation. Uh, Deputy Director of the Department of Land Natural Resources, uh, Keiko Kaluriba. Okay, any others that I might have missed? Oh, yes, Mr. Mutta, introduce. Thank you. Let me just get in and just a couple things. I'm going to talk a little bit, trying to set a big picture. Uh, and then I do have a couple of uh, the directors who are going to be talking about issues that are specific to the Windward side. Um, and then we'll uh, take questions and answers. So I know that they've established a protocol. And they should have been handing out cards if you wanted to um, ask questions specifically. Uh, we're going to try to get to as many questions as we can. But I do know that that's always a challenge as we move forward. Uh, I just wanted to, first of all, just thank uh, Chancellor Dykstra for uh, welcoming us uh, back to um, uh, Windward Community College. Uh, I wanted to uh, thank Jessica Spencer, president of ASUA, for the gift uh, and a warm welcome. Uh, Jessica, thank you so much. And Deborah Bates, the editor of uh, the new school newspaper here uh, for uh, we had an opportunity to speak a little bit before this program, uh, just so that we could hear the student concerns. Uh, I'm so excited to be back on the Windward campus. Um, as as um, Chancellor Dykstra talked, um, I spent a lot of time with uh, um, just Chancellor Pete Dyer uh, and Libby Young and Mark Na. Na <laughs> you know, I kept forgetting Mark's name, but and a really bunch of students because um, they were really the ones advocating for development of the Windward Community College campus here uh, 20 years ago. Uh, and you know, the thing that inspires me most, and Mike and I, when we are uh, working on it, is they truly were committed to delivering to the Windward side uh, quality educational opportunities. Uh, and I know that I'm on the Windward side, so I can say this, um, but I know I can get back. Of all the campus master plans that I've been a part of, I have to say that the Windward Community College master plan, I believe, is the most faithful implementation of really delivering uh, those programs and facilities uh, that are most important to the community. And just wanted to congratulate all of your area legislators for all of their work. campus and I would have to say over my 20 years uh, at the Capitol 
uh, there has always been a constant and consistent presence uh, representing the Windward community and truly has resulted in this beautiful campus here. So I think you all should be congratulated for the campus that you sit on. This is all about balancing, and I don't want to short circuit my director. So I'm going to kind of go through a number of topics uh, and then really give them time to present their information and then we'll take questions. But you know, we are here at the community college for a reason. It really is about preparing our communities. You know, I still remember talking to, to Mindy and Mark 20 years ago where we were talking about non-traditional students. The needs, the educational needs of our community today is so much broader than the traditional student, the 18 or 19 year old graduate uh, of high school going on to college. It really is about lifetime learning uh, throughout our community. And truly, Winter Community College, I believe, is an epitome of that. Really providing educational <coughs> services in the full spectrum of ages, backgrounds, um, <coughs> programs that are so important to our communities. <laughs> you know, the community college is really about preparing uh, our community for the 21st century. Uh, it really is where we can pick up those skills that are most important. Uh, and mo most importantly, the skills that our students need are just changing so rapidly as we move forward. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the vision of state government that I have and that our team is committed to implementing uh, on behalf of the people of Hawaii. It really does start with a uh, transformation of government. Uh, I'm committed to state government that is honest and transparent and responsive to its citizens. I do know that we can't be all things to all people. It really is about making choices. Um, most importantly, it's about making choices together, and that's why we're here uh, this, this first of many uh, community meetings, so we can uh, hear the concerns that you have as we shape um, how we want uh, state government to deliver services. Uh, we have to make choices. We definitely don't have unlimited resources. More importantly, we have heard that, that, that our taxpayers uh, don't want to be funding all services that the people of Hawaii would want. Now, yeah, I am committed to open government, and it starts with uh, an investment in uh, information technology. You know, I have been always for my career uh, a believer that technology does give us the opportunity, opportunity to deliver improved services at reduced cost. Uh, and I've spoken uh, numerous times about how old and antiquated the core infrastructure of state government uh, is. And we are committed and have made uh, significant progress, I believe, uh, in implementing those uh, systems um, that are so important to you. You know, I have uh, changed, been committed to changing the way that the state does business. You know, I will not tolerate um, contractors and consultants that do not deliver on the promises made. Uh, I've been criticized, but I do believe that if they're not delivering, that we should cancel contracts. Uh, and we have in a number of instances. Uh, it really is about ensuring that we get good value for taxpayer dollars. I'm also committed to changing the, the culture in state government. You know, I do believe that our public servants are the most important assets uh, that we have in state government. And it really is about uh, making investments in them and most importantly, engaging them and asking them, because they're the ones that are involved with delivering services to all of you on each and every day, they have the best ideas about how we can make government more efficient and effective. So it really is about engaging our employees, uh, working and asking them to be part of the solution, looking for ways that we can change the way that government provides services. You know, I. Um, and committed to creating a Hawaii that future generations uh, will choose to call home. It really is personal for me. I have three kids, you know, and they are away studying on the mainland. Uh, and I definitely want to create an environment and have an environment here uh, in Hawaii so that they can find um, 
challenging career opportunities that they can earn a, a decent wage, that they can uh, buy the home that they can afford, uh, and most importantly, they can decide to choose to call Hawaii home a uh, place that they, their families uh, can live and uh, raise a future. It's also about uh, their friends and ensuring that their friends can find uh, meaningful opportunities. Uh, and I want this entire generation to be enthusiastic about the Hawaii that we uh, leave to them so that they can choose to stay here and find ways to contribute to the state's economy and create that next wave of jobs and economic opportunities. It's really about them becoming stewards of our environment that we can and we must uh, turn over an environment that's worth protecting. More importantly, we must in, engage them and, and fulfill them with the commitment to protect the environment that is so important to so many of us. And then finally, it's really about contributing to enrich the social fabric that we call Hawaii home, that makes Hawaii so special uh, to each and every one of us. Um, and so we are working very hard um, to make things work for the long term. You know, sorry, I'm not about drama. It's not about getting uh, in the news every single night. For me, it really is about uh, choosing uh, great public servants to serve as directors, uh, great leaders, encouraging them to lead their departments. Most importantly, to look at the most challenging issues that we are confronted with, engage the community, ask for their assistance to find the best solution. But more importantly, look for those solutions that are long-term, that truly lead to a sustainable uh, solution that benefits the community for a long time. I just wanted to talk a little bit about the early successes in our administration. Uh, it really is about establishing a strong financial foundation. You know, I'm proud that we uh, were evaluated by all the rating agencies. So we are, we went to the bond market and we received the lowest cost of money, uh, I believe, in the history of the state of Hawaii. And more, more importantly, I met with all of the rating agencies to talk about what makes Hawaii a special place, about our com uh, commitment to sound fiscal programs, uh, and more importantly, uh, to live within our means. Uh, I'm proud of the fact that our bond rating was upgraded. Uh, and really, how does that impact you? It means that our cost of borrowing is lower. And more importantly, that we can build more at the same um, cost to the taxpayer. Uh, so that we can deliver facilities that are important to you, uh, important to your communities, important to the schools, Winter Community College, and with the rest of state government uh, in a very cost-effective way. <laughs> uh, I'm proud of the work that Fort Kuchigami and the Department of Transportation has done, Ed Smith, and you might have read it in the, in the newspaper. Sometimes they do write stories that um, that uh, we feel really terrific about. But, but you know, Ford, under his leadership, uh, we had the best year uh, in the last decade in spending federal dollars. You might have seen the articles about the federal government threatening to put us on watch because we're taking federal dollars and not spending it. Uh, Ford and his team reduced the backlog of tra highway transportation projects by more than $100 million in the first 10 months of my administration. <laughs> I think more importantly, and, and you'll hear some of that talk today about what we're trying to do with uh, when we're um, the GTV tunnel. You know, we are trying to find uh, better ways to deliver quality services uh, to all of you. Um, we, I'm so proud that with the help of the legislature, we closed on the Turtle Bay Preservation. The Conservation District was filed uh, on Friday. So forever we will uh, preserve the pristine coastline on the North Shore uh, near Cabela Bay so that you and your children and your children's children will have access to that last uh, ocean. <laughs> Your windward legislators were in that effort. You know, we 
have to restart that project because the the project uh, and the conservation district um, conservation easement was at risk, uh, and we were very close to losing that entire deal uh, during this past session. Uh, but with the help of uh, Church Kukuda and Representative Tito uh, and the rest of your leeward, uh, windward delegation, uh, we were able to redo the, the uh, deal and most importantly, it closed on Friday. So I'm going to wrap up my time so that we can get to the presentations by the directors. But, but let me just say this, you know, I am committed uh, to a more efficient government. I've always believed in leading by example. Uh, and so I was um, instrumental in bringing a paperless Senate to the state legislature. And the office of the governor has committed to lead again uh, by going paperless in the governor's office. We are leading uh, a program called e -Sign where we are signing uh, electronic documents. And I just want to say that what that means is that um, when we want to improve public access, if all of the documents are electronic, it is very simple for us to be able to, to deliver them to you if you're interested. Uh, and so it begins with that, and we are committed to changing all the state government to be paperless. I wanted to talk about one more success story. You know, for the last decade, the Kamomalu building on Richard Street has been vacant. You know, and the state has been talking. At the same time that the building has been vacant, we have been spending money on private leases all around downtown. You know, and uh, within the first two months of this administration, we were able to kick off the Kamomalu building renovation. And with a bit of, uh, we hope to complete that project by the middle of next year. And more importantly, it allows us to stop paying private uh, lease rent into the community uh, and really begin to use state facilities in a more cost effective manner. So, <laughs> so, just a couple of things uh, in introducing the cabinet members or other team members uh, presenting tonight. You know, as I said before, it really is about changing the culture of state government, and it starts with leadership. I look to assemble a cabinet of leaders, and that's first and foremost. Uh, the other part of that, I really wanted collaborative leaders, leaders that were committed to engaging the community, to viewing the community as part of the solution rather than part of the problem. And then more importantly, to work through the challenges facing state government together with the community. Uh, the core values of the cabinet was really about doing the right thing, for the right reasons, in the right way. Um, and I'm so proud of the cabinet that we've assembled. Uh, part of the program tonight, starting first, will be uh, Dr. Jimmy Pressler, Director of the Department of Health. She'll be talking about the uh, Hawaii State Hospital plans. Uh, Director Ford Fujigami, or, or Deputy Ed Smith, and I don't know who's doing the honors tonight, but really talking about um, uh, the Wilson Tunnel updates. And then finally, Scott Marashigi, who is uh, the head of the Interagency uh, Council on Homelessness, will be talking a little bit about homelessness. Uh, so with that, Dr. Pressler, thank you all. <laughs> Thank you, Governor, and I am so very, very proud to be part of this cabinet. It's been a real pleasure. It's also a real pleasure for me to be here this evening on your Windward Community College campus. As the Director of Health, I am a great believer that education is very fundamental to a healthy community and to a healthy state. Uh, what I want to do this evening is just very briefly uh, give you an update on what's happening with your closest neighbor, which is the Hawaii State Hospital. Um, the, the Hawaii State Hospital is the only hospital in the state that's dedicated solely to serving patients with serious mental illness. It was established in 1932 under the territory of Hawaii, and it is the only public psychiatric hospital in the state. But it, it was built on a 103-acre well, site 
uh, which included the 64 acres that's now the, the uh, Wayward Community College. So we clearly are uh, co-located uh, neighbors on the state land. It was built, uh, the, the, the hospital campus that we're using today was built for 178 patients. Uh, a recent census has been consistently over 200 patients per day, frequently and recently as high as 215 patients. And in addition to that, we have another 42 patients in contracted beds at Happy Mahalik. So the total recent need for patient beds has been 257 beds. Now, the original hospital was not built for the kinds of patients that we have today. It was a community uh, public uh, psychiatric hospital. Um, in 2005, we had a master plan uh, that was uh, created in order to address the growing needs for this population. That plan was never implemented due to fiscal constraints. Uh, since then, as you can see on this graph, um, in the last 10 years, we've had a doubling of the number of admissions to the state hospital since the master plan was done 10 years ago. We have a new master plan that uh, was done in 2015, and I want to share a little bit about that uh, with you today. Uh, the important thing to emphasize is that uh, in addition to being over capacity every day, uh, we are only able to take court-ordered patients at this point. Um, we don't have capacity for community needs on top of that. And we must take every court-ordered patient. We cannot turn anyone away. So regardless of the fact that we're over capacity, and uh, we are currently using offices, therapy rooms, and conference rooms uh, as bedrooms in order to accommodate these patients, uh, we must accept uh, any patient that is court-ordered. So um, we clearly have a need for additional beds. Uh, our first priority is safety. Safety for the community, safety for our staff, and safety for our patients. So we have a new master plan. And the best way to uh, share that with you is to show you a, a little map. Um, this area, uh, Windward Community College, is the, uh, the rectangle there. That's where we are right now. And if you look up the words green up there, that uh, pronged, uh, um, uh, point on the, on the map there, that will be a new 144 bed state of the art forensic uh, state <coughs> hospital system. This will allow for us to provide safer, better care for our patients and for your community. Now, that new uh, hospital, which will be allowing us to provide better care, is going to take anywhere from seven to eight years to build. I'm going to do everything I possibly can and be twisting everybody's arms in the state to try to do it faster. We need it now, but I'm being told it will take seven to eight years to get it done. So in order to meet the current needs, we are working very hard at rebuilding community-based um, behavioral health services throughout the state in order to provide more outpatient care, trying to relieve the, the system and the need for more inpatient admissions. But in addition, in the short run, a critical component of our comprehensive plan to address the needs of the state are to build where it says number five there, the pale yellow, right next to Windward Community College. This is the Bishop Building, which is empty. And uh, we have, we'll be using uh, other people's money, not state dollars, for a long-term lease uh, with Avalon, uh, uh, which will build a long-term care facility for these really complex patients. 42 of the beds will be, 48 of the beds will be designated for uh, severely mentally ill patients who need long-term care. And we cannot place them in the community. They are currently taking up hospital beds in our state hospital. If we can move them into this new long-term care facility, which can be built in another two to three years, that will help us offload the, uh, the, the crunch on the current hospital until we can build a new uh, state hospital. That's the big picture plan that we have. And I 
think that's all I'm going to say for now because I'd be happy to answer questions later. And at this time, I would like to introduce uh, Deputy Director of Department of Health, Health from our Department of Health, from the Department of Transportation, uh, Ed Smith.
while we're in there doing the project, we're also going to take care of all the spawning concrete. There's, when you look up in the tunnel, there's air vents that suck the air up into the clam. Around those air vents, the concrete is spawning. It's breaking off from the rebarring areas because of the rebar corrosion. So pulling all the, all the like, broken concrete out, readjusting the rebar, and reforming and reforming and reforming. Yeah. So after we're done with it, the ceiling um, won't be, there won't be any cracking in the ceiling. And the tunnel, a portion will be supported by the, by the steel bar. So by 31st, we're looking at the 31st completing the work in the town um, direction. It'll take us a couple of days to pull out the shoring and uh, the barrier system. So by the second, it should be done with the town bottom portion. The other bottom portion is starting up on the 28th. And we're going to be looking at single lane closures nightly until the 4th. We could expedite that, but right now it's the schedule. So by the 4th, Sorry, by the fourth, we can finish up and we can pull everything out. So by the fifth, we're hoping to be done with this project. We'll keep sending updates to your area legislators. They've been amazing at, at asking us to keep involved with them, making sure that we get out enough information to the community. And we'll absolutely do that. So right now, the, the schedule is to complete all of the work by the fifth. Until then, the single lane closures in the daytime up to 4 p.m. will be in effect. From 4 p.m. Uh, sorry, from 9 p.m. will be in effect. From 9 p.m. to 4 a.m. A little bomb and we shut the tunnel down to make sure we complete the work. Um, from the 28th, we're going to be starting up a single lane closure in the Kanye Bond direction from 9 p.m. to 4 a.m. And we won't affect anything during the, the piece of travel time. That's all I have. I know I'd be happy to answer any questions later. Um, I'm, I feel very privileged to introduce Mr. Scott Morishi here, um, the governor's coordinator on the Chair Phil Takuda, your senator, you know, she really has been a firebrand in the governor's leadership team, really allowing us to identify opportunities, uh, really never taking no for an answer, and really turning the departments upside down to really uh, tackle this homelessness issue. So I just wanted to ask Jill to stand. Uh, I just wanted to acknowledge you. Thank you so much uh, progress in the challenge of homelessness in the last uh, four or six weeks. Take it away, Scott. Thank you, Governor. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you all for joining us um, this evening. I really um, do believe it's really um, impressive that the committee has such a turnout, great turnout tonight. And I, I wanted to echo the Governor's comments also and really thank you, Senator Tukula, for the leadership in this issue. You know, um, just starting in this position even you know, two months ago, I think it was really critical that we had a great team of leaders on our leadership team to address homelessness. I included our governor, our mayor, our entire congressional um, delegation, the city council chair, um, Chair Kikuda, Chair Luke from the state house. It really was critical that we had alignment um, at all levels of our government, at federal, state, and at the county level. I think without that leadership and without that alignment, we would not have been able to make the progress that we made on today. So I, I just wanted to thank Chair Kukuda and our other leaders again for their continued support, for their participation on the leadership team. But I wanted to um, you know, start off in just sharing a little bit about the issue of homelessness that we're facing in Hawaii right now. And really start by providing a snapshot of what it looks like on any given night. So on any given night in Hawaii, we have approximately 7,600 homeless individuals statewide. This isn't an issue just isolated to Oahu. Homelessness is an issue that we're seeing in every county throughout our state on every island. And we've seen um, dramatic increases over the past few years. Just between 2014 and 2015, we've seen a 23% increase in unsheltered, in the number of unsheltered homeless individuals across our state. But perhaps more alarmingly, we've seen also a 46% increase in the number of unsheltered family households, meaning that there are more and more minor children living in families, living unsheltered on our streets, sidewalks, and beaches. Because of that, it's very critical that we come together as a community to address this issue, and we really need to do more. And I think we have started to do so. Um, it's clear, you know, when we look at the data related to homelessness, again, that it's not just an Oahu issue, it's really a statewide issue that touches every community. And just looking at the information um, 
for what the homeless population looks like here in Glenward Oahu, you know, we've seen also here a 33% increase in the number of unsheltered homeless individuals just between last year and this one. So how do we address such a complex issue? And homelessness really is complex because there's no one cause. There's many different factors. There's individuals who fall into homelessness due to economic factors, people who fall into homelessness due to mental health, due to substance use. It's very complex. And at the same time, homelessness also took many, many years um, to develop. It took years for us our homeless problem in Hawaii to get to the point that it is now. So when we're looking at solutions, it really also is going to take time for us to really effectively address this issue. There are no silver bullet solutions. But I think, again, I think we are starting to see some really early signs of progress. And partly um, what's contributed to um, our success, our early successes, is we have a framework um, to address this issue statewide that involves three main components. First is the use of data, really understanding the needs of the homeless individuals and families that we're seeing in our community, understanding who they are, you know, sort of their demographic information, how best we can target our services um, to best get them off the streets more quickly. Second, um, you know, we really need to um, focus on coordination, um, aligning all levels of our government, just as we have with the governor's leadership team on homelessness, bringing, bringing together leaders from the federal, county, and state governments. And third, um, the third piece of our framework really is community mm -hmm. dialogue participate in events just like this one tonight, where we really have an opportunity to hear from people in the community and really engage the whole community to be part of the solution and to be part of how we really start to address this issue and start to make progress. Um, to give you an example of how we apply these three points of work, I wanted to share a little bit about the situation in Kakaakumakai, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with because of the media coverage very really recently. So when I started in this position, the Kakaako Makai was really at the forefront. And I think our approach to addressing the situation in Kakaako really started again with the governor's leadership team on homelessness, bringing together the community to really make sure that despite um, many different individuals trying to address this issue and take it head on, that we started to have better alignment between our different sectors of government. So that the approaches, whether it was the city and county's approach, um, you know, to go ahead with enforcement in Kakaako, whether it was the legislators' approach or the state's approach, that they all started to be aligned. Um, we also realized um, in looking at the problem that data was a critical element to this too. Because when we started and we asked people, well, what's the size of the population in Kakaako? You know, what does that population look like? Very few people were able to actually give solid answer. There were a lot of guesses. And you know, I think there's 500 people there. I think maybe there's 600 people, but there were no you know, solid, hard numbers that people could provide. So the first thing that the leadership team did was really pull together our homeless service providers. We worked with Partners in Care, who's a coalition of homeless um, providers here on Oahu. And we asked them to do a count in Kanaako. So during the first week of August, they went out, they did a count, and they estimated that there were, um, they counted that there were a little under 300 people in the community, 293 individuals, including 31 families. And we also got from that count um, information about what the homeless population in Kakaako looks like. And um, what we learned from that was really startling. Um, there's extreme poverty in the homeless encampment in Kakaako. For example, for a single individual, their income, average income is less than $300 a month. And for a household of four, they earn just a little bit more than $500 a month. That's well below 100% of the poverty level. Um, so <coughs> understanding what that situation was, that really helped government and service providers to figure out, well, what interventions would be most effective? You know, knowing that the income levels of people in that area were so low, shelter was going to be one of the alternatives we wanted to offer because it allows people time to increase their income and to really stabilize. At the same time, we realized that there were some individuals in the area that were um, very, very sick, struggling with you know, mental health and substance issues, who are long-term chronically homeless individuals. And for those people, we offered housing first and other interventions that transitioned them more quickly into permanent housing. 
we also you know, look um, to other national leaders um, that have been providing technical assistance to Hawaii's community to look at, well, what's the best way um, to address a homeless encampment like that in Kapa'apu? A national best practice, according to the U.S. Marines Council on Homelessness, is that you provide advance notice first to those in the encampment. You give them time to relocate and find other options about where to go. So we did that. In coordination with the city, we provided time before the enforcement began. And then we consistently sent outreach workers into the area every week for a solid two and a half months, from the beginning of August to when the enforcement ended just um, the other week. And consistently, outreach workers went in offering uh, access to shelter and permanent housing. And through that coordinated approach, we were able to move over half of the population, um, 158 of the 293 individuals off the street, into shelter, and also into permanent housing. I think more than that. Even more significantly, we were able to move 25 of the 31 families, so that's 80% of the unsheltered families in the area off the street as well. So I think that wouldn't have happened, you know, without the close focus on data the post coordination and also the dialogue that we've had with the community, with the different stakeholders in the Kaka'ako area, individuals from the homeless encampment themselves, and homeless service providers. So I, I share that with you because I think the framework that we use in Kaka'ako really is a model that we can apply statewide to Windward Oahu, but also every island throughout our state. Because again, we know that homelessness is a statewide issue. Looking forward, we've already started to make some steps in applying this model to other areas of our state. We've started to collect data about homeless encampments in Windward, Oahu, in Watawa, on, and on the Waianae Coast. And I think that information really is starting to help our service providers target specific interventions um, to address the needs of homeless individuals in these areas. We've also, um, yeah, as many of you may know, the governor did sign an emergency proclamation the other week that increases the level of funding for programs that are state that quickly transition individuals and families out of homelessness into permanent housing. So we increased the level of funding for housing first on Oahu, but also on the neighbor islands. We increased the level of funding for our housing placement program, which targets unsheltered homeless families with minor children. And we increased the level of funding for our emergency grant program which assists those who are immediately homeless, uh, immediately homeless as well as those at risk of falling into homelessness. We've also started to engage other sectors of our community to help us approach this issue. Um, we formed a strong partnership with the Hawaii Association of Realtors, and we're planning to hold a landlord summit um, starting on November 17th, which will be a, really a way for us to outreach to landlords and property managers in the community help educate them about the issues facing our homeless individuals and families throughout the state and really share with landlords about some of the homeless programs that we have that help to successfully transition people off the streets into housing. So this is just some of our approach um, moving forward and a lot of positive things um, to look forward to as we continue to address this problem and we continue to engage communities across the state to be part of the solution. Um, you know, thank you again for you know, the opportunity to share with you this evening, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have again. Thank you. Well, hi, everybody. Uh, now we get to the question and answer part. Um, I'm going to be your moderator, and I've been, I've been handed down. So there's probably about, what, 100 plus people here. We have, I want to be respectful of the time. We had until the expectation was that the meeting would go to about 8.30. So we have about a little more than half an hour. We got, we probably have like 100 questions. And so <laughs> <laughs> we're not going to be able to get to all of the answers. So what the staff did was when you came in, everybody signed a little question card. And what they've been doing um, since you came in was they tried to group them by issues. So in my hand, I'm holding 10 issues um, that I think, uh, wow, they're, they're really good questions. And so we're going to give the first question to um, 
our host this evening, Luna Community College, to the student voice, Colorado newspaper. Uh, and that first question is, how can our public schools improve their college preparatory programs, or in general, be more competitive with mainland schools to increase students' chances of enrollment in mainland colleges being successful, or being successful in college? Let me do that again. I'm not sure if I get that one. How can our public schools improve their college repertory programs or in general be more competitive with mainland schools to increase students' chances of enrollment in mainland colleges and or be successful in college? So it's a college repertory question. Uh, a couple of things. Let me just uh, say, and, and you know, again, your um, Wayward delegation truly has been uh, advocates for public education. There's a couple of things that I truly believe are game changers in our public schools. Uh, and it really starts with what I believe, that dual credit, that dual enrollment. Uh, it's the early college. Uh, you, know, I, you know, I really believe that our public schools can be the best public school system in the country. And it starts with programs like early college. You know, I see that as a game changer in the sense that it gives our public schools a competitive advantage for keeping the best the best students uh, in the public school system. And how is that? It's because our community colleges are working with our high school so that when a student takes English that qualifies for college credit, they get both the, the high school credit and the college credit at the same time. And you've seen across the high schools in our community uh, then more and more of the principals are encouraging students to take these dual credit classes. And I do know that some of the principals are so bold to expect that their high school students would graduate with Associate of Arts degrees uh, when they finish. I know you laugh, but I do know that there are schools that have enrolled like 500 students of 12. They have 500 enrollments in the community college system, earning high school credit and college credit at the same time. So thanks to Tula, you know, it really, I believe, is, is the great answer for moving our public school systems forward in that whole issue of college and career ready. Thank you, Governor. The next question is on homelessness. <laughs> Is it true that you will be relocating the homeless to a site in Windward, Oahu? <laughs> um, you know, I think part of the strategy really is finding shelter spaces in each and every community because homeless, homelessness has reached each and every community. Uh, so we have been, I'll be honest with you, we have been trying to find uh, sites on the Windward side uh, so that we can uh, shelter the homeless on the windward side uh, in areas that, that people choose to um, spend their time in. Uh, so we don't have any specific uh, location at this point in time, but we are looking at state properties uh, all across the state that would be suitable for uh, establishing an emergency shelter. But I think most importantly, we want to find a permanent housing situation for them. You might have read uh, in the paper that we're working with the uh, Hawaii Realtors Association. We are organizing, working with the city, state, and federal partners again, organizing a, a summit with all the landlords to try and explain to them the benefits of um, renting to uh, sec Section 8 vouchers and other rental assistance programs. You know, we do have a, a number of um, our community members who have vouchers but have nowhere to go. It really is about trying to get more permanent solutions for that. Uh, so again, we are trying to uh, disperse the homeless so we don't have huge encampments that numbers hundreds of people. It's really working with community partners, uh, working with service providers, uh, looking to establish a range of services in each and every community so that we can be build, uh, begin to build a network of service providers all, all across the state. Thank you. Our next uh, issue is uh, the topic of energy. 
and specifically the HEI Nextera merger. I am concerned that this will lead to a loss of jobs in Hawaii. Yes, I share your concern. I, I mean, you know, let me just say this. I have three agencies that are uh, engaged as interveners in that uh, proposed merger. You know, I have directed all of them to do their job. It really is about taking a 360 degree view of the merger, uh, ask the question about what the benefit is uh, to the public and to the community. But, you know, and then as we go through the process, we'll make a decision about whether the proposed merger is in the public interest or not. But let me just uh, put it this way. You know, if you look at the proposed merger, um, they, they propose that shareholders get $540 million uh, for their trouble. They propose that executives get more than $10 million for their trouble. They propose that um, contractors get $20 million for their trouble. They propose that all of the rest of us uh, share $60 million, which isn't a whole lot. And I, you know, as I said, I'm asking the agencies to look at it on your behalf to really examine whether the proposed merger is in the public's interest. And that's how we will uh, drive our engagement on the issue. <coughs> the next issue is vacation rentals. Uh -oh. <laughs> Too many properties are transitioning to vacation rentals or vacation homes, including beachfront estates masquerading as farms. This decreases affordable homes, access to the ocean, destroys a beauty of our island. Um, you know, vacation rentals, I think, um, has exploded all across the state. Uh, the Hawaii Tourism Authority did uh, a survey uh, last year uh, and discovered that virtually for every um, uh, hotel room all across the state, there is uh, a vacation rental somewhere. Uh, so it, it really has gotten to be a very huge challenge. You know, the legislature um, um, passed a measure really that is looking from the state's perspective making sure that they are paying taxes to the state. Uh, so the law, it really um, requires disclosure. It requires that every advertisement identify their state tax ID number so that we can keep track of them. And most importantly, it does require a local contact uh, of the vacation rental. So it's not a perfect solution. I know that the city council all across the state is wrestling with the issue of how to manage uh, the vacation rentals. Some of them are permitted legally, others are not. Um, but it's a big challenge for our community. Thank you very much. Our next uh, question has to do with um, the Hockey Google Learning Center, which is a charter school here that uh, is shared on the campus. <clears throat> the Windward Community College Hockey Google Learning Center Charter School and the Department of Health are all state entities providing very important services to our community. Why, why can we not find win-win solutions to ensure all may continue to offer these services and grow their programs? Despite repeat officers offers for a land swap from Woodward Community College that would enable all three entities to realize their services DOH refuses these offers. Woodward Community College offer would be would provide a Woodward solution. Please support the WCC offer for a long-term sustainable solution for all three state entities. Well, I think the challenge um, that all of us uh, in state government uh, face is that we have competing needs. Uh, for many uh, of the limited state resources we have. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I uh, am proud that I authored the, the uh, first charter school legislation because I really do believe that uh, charter schools offer uh, our communities uh, an alternative uh, to traditional schools. And I think that uh, many charter schools and, and uh, hockey school has one of the very earliest uh, charter schools uh, in our community. <laughs> have really provided value, uh, valuable educational opportunities uh, to our communities. 
Um, uh, the other side of that point is that the Hawaii State Hospital provides uh, valuable services to our communities. Uh, and we need to find a way to uh, move forward. Um, you know, again, we'll be looking at um, the challenges that face uh, all the entities uh, and trying to find a way forward that makes the most sense. Uh, it's very clear that we have a severe um, challenge at the Hawaii State Hospital in the sense that the census is much too high for the facilities and we need to uh, find a solution to uh, provide relief in that area. Uh, at the same time, I am aware of the challenges uh, facing our charter schools uh, regarding facilities, uh, and we are committed to work through those challenges uh, moving forward. Thank you. Okay, the next uh, the next issue um, is TMT. Why do you continue to push TMT while spending taxpayers' money? To arrest those who stand up to protect our water and aina. Now, as governor, I am committed to enforcing the law, um, and I I am committed to assuring that those that uh, seek uh, state permission to proceed with projects are are able to exercise um, the authority or the approvals that they have received. Um, when I became governor on December 1st, uh, the state had made a decision to allow the 30 meter telescope project to proceed forward. As governor, I am responsible for ensuring uh, that the state can provide access uh, to the 30 meter telescope project uh, as they are permitted and approved uh, to do so. I would note that that um, decision is being challenged in the Supreme Court, uh, and the Supreme Court has yet to decide, uh, and they are the ultimate decider in regards to whether uh, the project uh, received the approvals that um, it uh, should have received. Uh, until the court makes a decision, I am, uh, I am obligated as governor to uh, implement the project as a you know, on a personal note, I do support the project. I do believe that um, there is uh, an opportunity that the project represents uh, for our community uh, to be uh, a leader in, um, in astronomy uh, that we do not have uh, elsewhere. At the same time, I do believe that we haven't done a, a good job in managing the, the summit. You know, I do believe that um, there are too many people uh, that has access uh, to the summit. You know, I announced the 10 point plan about two months ago that really is about uh, the state living up to its commitments made. Uh, that includes uh, decommissioning and removal of those telescopes that are beyond their useful life. Uh, I'm working with the university, and they've announced that three of the telescopes that are currently uh, on Mauna Kea will be removed. Uh, and I'm uh, working very hard to see that happen. Thank you very much. Thank you for your uh, honesty and your candor. Now comes the hard questions. Okay, so <laughs> this is the directors. <laughs> <laughs> so this one has to do with the health connector. Will the state pursue legal retribution, possibly monetary damages, from the contractors that work on the Hawaii Health Collector? Is there a case? Uh, let me just say that I have um, instructed the Attorney General's office to do their job. It really is about examining uh, all of those um, contracts and making a determination about whether we have a case. Uh, as you may know, in the case of the Department of Transportation, I did uh, terminate a contract because the contractor was unable to fulfill the legal requirements of the contract. Uh, we had filed a lawsuit, uh, and we were informed uh, by the court that that wasn't appropriate action. 
but we are working through the details of that. Um, I am committed to ensuring that all of you get good value for the tax, your taxpayer dollars when we initiate these um, projects. Uh, and again, we'll be working with the Attorney General's office to look at the transactions uh, and the uh, activities associated with the health connector. Uh, and if we do uh, have a case, uh, we will pursue it. Thank you very much. Our next issue is uh, the issue of medical marijuana. <laughs> With medical marijuana dispensaries legal as of 2016, are you for or against recreational marijuana legalization in the future? Um, I am against uh, recreational use of um, marijuana. Um, it is against the law at the federal level, and I really do believe that uh, we need to be consistent. I, um, I voted against the law to allow for medical marijuana. Uh, and uh, at that time when I voted against the original law, it was because uh, there was no legal way for someone who had a prescription uh, to use medical marijuana uh, to get access to it except to grow it themselves or to have a transaction that's illegal. So I do support the implementation of medical marijuana because it does allow for a legal way for someone who can benefit from the use of marijuana <coughs> to be able to get access without having to um, get to the illegal activity. Uh, but I am opposed to recreational use until the federal government changes the law. Thank you. <laughs> Our next question or issue is uh, the issue of um, GMO. Why are you allowing Monsanto, Dow, DuPont, Syngenta, to poison our Mohana. The children are suffering. When will you support a ban on carcinogenic Roundup um, as California is labeling products? This is from uh, Hawaii. We have strict laws uh, regulating the use of harmful chemicals uh, in the agriculture industry, and we uh, are committed to enforcing the laws. Uh, the, the federal laws and state laws uh, regulate the use of uh, these harmful chemicals. The, uh, the users have to be certified to be able to apply, uh, and they have to um, apply it and use the chemicals within uh, the strict guidelines um, uh, that are written for them. Um, so I am committed to supporting all agriculture. Um, I do believe that it's important. Uh, I do believe about enforcing the law and ensuring that those who are using uh, these chemicals are using it appropriately and safely. And then third, the Department of Health is really tasked with uh, <coughs> testing and assuring that uh, the chemicals are not getting into our water supply uh, and so that we can keep the water supply uh, safe and secure. Uh, and so all of those things, you know, it, the challenge is about finding balance, uh, about we are committed uh, to doubling the production of food that we need. Uh, Chair Enright is really committed uh, to work a uh, strategic plan, make uh, appropriate lands available to farmers that are uh, vested and committed to producing more of the food that we need. Uh, and we are uh, committed to great, um, enforcing regulations and assuring that uh, uh, chemicals are being applied as uh, as it should be uh, and that they are not reaching our categories. Thank you, Governor. Uh, next issue is transportation. The state is helping uh, Enterprise Rentals Vanpool plan with the city. I think it's one and a half million. State needs to work with the city bus as well. Many tourists use the number 55 bus up to the North Shore. Um, can we spend and set up a better 
bus system uh, with less traffic and road widening? Can the state and the city work together? Uh, we definitely are working together. You know, Ford Fujigami is a great director. He really has uh, taken the bull by the horn. You know, I've asked him to work with our county uh, counterparts, and he has uh, bent over backwards in terms of meeting and engaging uh, with our uh, county counterparts. I don't know if you've looked uh, forward at. Uh, I can actually answer that question. Sure. See, Ford was thinking that he was going to get a buy this evening, so I'm glad that you guys asked the question, so he didn't uh, um, feel like he wasn't uh, welcome here tonight. <laughs> actually, the state legislature actually appropriated $500,000 this year, $500,000 next year. It's a two-year program, and possibly in the third year. But it is that the uh, $500,000 is actually allocated through the Department of uh, Transportation to the DTS, which is the Department of Transportation Services. It is to go ahead and try to supplement any agency, whether it's Enterprise, Vanpool, Hawaii, or anyone who wants to apply for these funds to promote Vanpool. What we need to do between the state and the city is try to remove as much vehicles off the street as possible because of the, basically the sustainability. Fossil fuels is something that for us to get the governor's goal of the 100% renewable by 2045, 65% of it is within my division, DOT, and that's what we're working on. As governor indicated, we do work very closely with Mike Foley and his crew. Every community meeting that we go to when it talks about transportation is myself, Deputy Director Sniffen, the director for DTS, the deputy director for DTS. And if you're living on the leeward side, it also includes heart. So there's a lot of collaboration. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for can you stay right there? There's one more. <laughs> I'm going to, I want to ask this other question uh, regarding transportation as well. Uh, you know, as you know, we've had a lot of pain on this side <clears throat> over the last few weeks. And, um, so this one uh, has to do with Kamehameha Highway. In Ka'ahapunalu and Ha'ula, uh, they're all falling in the ocean. Also, Waikani Stream often floods and closes Kameha, Kamehameha Highway. Why can't this be fixed? <laughs> okay. I think everybody's heard about climate change. It is a major, major issue. Uh, climate change basically is, is rising. You know, I get questions all the time is that how long before a reef one layer is going to be under the water? And again, it goes back to our carbon footprint, it goes back to the burning of fossil fuels. Many of our roads run along our coastline, as you all know, especially since you live on this windward side. Because of that, as the water rises because of climate change, basically our roads start to fall into the water. We work in Kaaba in Ray McCormick, who is the administrator for highways back here, worked very, very hard. We declared an emergency. We tried to get it fixed. We are looking at this. At the same time we're looking at repairing these roads, we're also looking at what do we need to do to go ahead and take care of climate change. Because if we don't do anything about climate change, all our roads are going to start to fall in the water as long as they're running along the shoreline. Thank you. And I just wanted to acknowledge Dr. Chris Lee. You know, Chris Lee has been the Chris. champion for climate change. Chris really has been leaders at the state capitol and really advocating for a lot of these issues that you guys care about. And Chris has been the champion for climate change and really beginning to address the issues about how close, <coughs> what the setback should be, what we need to be in doing now in order to avoid the challenges that climate change brings. Thank you, Governor. So we're coming to uh, close to the 8.30 time, and we have uh, one more question. And I just want to, again, thank you for um, <coughs> taking all of the hard questions. And how about a big round of applause? <laughs> for so the night is not over, because I know that we didn't get a chance to do a lot of questions. And some of you may have come from far, and I want you guys to know that uh, all of the questions are very important. 
and we know that there's a lot of passion behind it. So we've asked uh, the governor's staff to hang around after the meeting so that you can have a face-to-face -face, uh, opportunity to talk with them as well, as well as the governor. Um, so the night's not going to be over. Now we go to the kind of informal talk story part, okay, after 8.30. So I would encourage you guys, if you have a burning question that you really want to ask, we have a lot of the governor's staff that's here, uh, as well as uh, Mike McCartney and two other okay. So the last question is, and this is coming from a future voter governor, uh, and that's because uh, he's he's a little boy, and he asked this question, Governor Ige, where do you see the state of Hawaii at the end of your term as governor? Oh. <laughs> is that a public school question? No. <laughs> that's an eight plus question. You know, for me, it really is about uh, our our family and our community. It really is about changing the trajectory of Hawaii really about transforming the culture of government, uh, really focused on community engagement and in asking and inviting the communities to be part of the solution as we move forward. It's about creating opportunities for my children, for your children, uh, for all of their friends, so that they have the choice of finding a career that they would want to be committed to uh, right here at home. It's about creating opportunities for them to be able to purchase a home and most importantly to raise a family if they choose to call Hawaii home. It's about engaging all of you to help us uh, do the heavy lifting of state government. It's about engaging and making the choices because we know that we cannot be all things to all people. Uh, and I do uh, ask you to be part of the solution I thank you for spending uh, an hour and a half or two hours of your time here uh, this evening to join us uh, and members of the cabinet. I wanted to thank uh, all of the area uh, representatives and senators who joined us um, here this evening uh, because they have been so supportive of us uh, moving forward and working together. Uh, so it's really about uh, creating and defining the Hawaii that we want to call home. I uh, invite you to be part of that. I invite you to be engaged. Uh, I'm going to ask the directors to come forward so that if you have any other specific questions you might have, uh, that they uh, are here and available to uh, respond to them. You know, I had the opportunity to meet with Mike Buskey, uh the CEO of GameStop. How many of you know GameStop here in other malls? You know, it's a remarkable conversation, but he talked about how he is trying to change the culture within his company because he knows that if, if the rate of change inside his company doesn't exceed the rate of change outside of his company, he, he's on the, on the verge of being bankrupt. You know, for us, it's really about trying to change the culture in state government, about being uh, nimble and responsive, about engaging the community to be part of the solution about finding ways that we can work together to solve the most challenging problems and, and finding the opportunity of creating the Hawaii that we would all want to have our children and our children's children to be part of. So thank you again very much for being here tonight. Thank you for taking so much time and thank you uh, Chancellor Dykstra and all the students and faculty and staff here at Woodward Community College for sharing your camp, uh, campus with uh, our leadership team and the community. Mahalo. There's some refreshments over here, so please hang around, and uh, the governor's staff will be here. Uh, thank you. Aloha.